Welcome back live. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Mythicist Milwaukee Show, keeping the all-seeing eye of Horace on the secular movement. I'm your host, Rob Moore, the deacon of doubt with me this week. In fact, the minister of mythicism himself uh, in for Brian is Sean Frasick. Say hi to the people, Sean. Hi to the people, Sean. Thanks, man. Never gets old, does it? Yikes. Uh, I feel like a 30 slapstick show here, vaudeville. Uh, no, uh, we are podcasting as we do every week here from downtown Milwaukee, the Grand Avenue Mall, the Bucket Works location upstairs from TJ Maxx, and uh, you can come out and join us uh, while we do the show, or you can uh, come to the uh, weekly meeting afterwards where we have uh, business going on and we decide the future of the secular movement here in Milwaukee, and we have a good time doing that, and part of what we do is bring you secular guests from around the globe, topical, exciting guests, and in order to keep doing that, of course, we need your support. We want to direct everybody to the MythicistMilwaukee.com webpage, where you can follow the links to our Patreon, and uh, uh, please support our Patreon as best you can. You can pledge per show, you can pledge per time period, you can pledge uh, any way you want, any amount you like, uh, but please do go to Patreon and find us and support us. Uh, today we have a uh, a young man who has delved into the Vedic scripture, something I know little about myself. I'm very excited to hear what he has to talk about. He is... Uh, 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 A.K.A. Vrin is what he likes to be known as. He feels that there's a, a, a kind of a grand global congruity among every ancient civilization. He's very into the symbols, uh, the same sacred symbols, uh, uh, having the same significance and parallels and meanings uh, throughout every civilization uh, in every uh, time period and every geographical location, language, or race. So uh, to me, it's a neat uh, topic, man. I don't know much about it. So please welcome to the program, everybody, uh, Brandon Parker. How are you, Brandon? Good, good. Happy to be here. All right. Uh, calling in. Yes, calling in from uh, Haleiwa, Hawaii. Haleiwa, we know where that is, some of us, but uh, the rest of you can be jealous that Brandon's calling from Hawaii because <laughs> winter, you know what, it's not too bad here. It's a nice 40, 45 degrees. We are in a nice December. Uh, so thank yeah. thank El Nino as it goes by for us. Uh, he's bringing us yeah. <laughs> kind of a mild winter so far. But, yeah, calling from Hawaii is Brandon. Uh, did I sort of give you any kind of a intro? Is that what you do? You're Are you into the... Uh, uh, the religions involved with the Vedic scriptures is it more of a course of study for you, is it, or is it a an actual lifestyle and a philosophy that you that you uh, follow yourself? Well, um, as a child, um, I was absorbed in it from the age of four years old to fourteen years old, and um, I guess I didn't have a choice there. My mom put me in a Vedic school called the Gurukul system, and um, I learned about the culture from within the culture. So it's a field of knowledge, um, which if you look at a lot of the um, academic culture, academic studies, they always do it from outside the culture, like anthropology, et cetera. But then there are a lot of people who are studying from within the culture, from within the tradition. And when we speak of the Vedic, which is often identified as Hinduism, which is a misnomer, but that's another topic. We're dealing with something that's actually a living culture as we speak today. So, for example, when you, if you go to India or Bali or even Vietnam, you'll see that people doing rituals and practices that were going on three, five, even up to 6,000 or more years ago, and it's the same exact traditions and cultures, uh, older than the pyramids or whatever. But the dichotomy is that these ancient traditions are never allowed to speak for themselves so if you study these cultures, generally you'll learn from someone outside of the culture. So I'm representing someone who is well-versed and studied in the culture itself and can speak from that perspective. So as a lifestyle, I try to add what I can to it, but it is the modern age. And as you know, everything throughout time atrophies, even the most beautiful gold sullies over time. So we find in so-called Hinduism, caste problem issues, you know, women's rights issues, etc. Uh, so the goal is just to get back to the original template and focus on. I just wanted to chime in real quick here, Brandon. Um, one of the things yeah. we do as uh, Mythicist Milwaukee 
been doing this for mm-hmm. a little over three three years now. Um, we like to kind of look at the ancient religions and we showcase how those religions have made up the foundation of what we uh, observe as the modern day popular religions, such as the Abrahamic faiths. Um, so, like when when you say the the Vedic religion or the mm-hmm. Vedism actually predates Egypt and uh, Hinduism, can you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, basically, uh, what we find is that Vedic civilization or culture, or the traditions, they didn't originate from the minds of men or humanity. There's actually a term called aparusheya, which means not from mankind. So let's, a better word than Vedic would be Dharma, because we include Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and from my research, I'm finding even ancient Egyptian, all the ancient root cultures were what I would refer to as Vedic. Why? Because if we look at fire, for example, or water, or these forces of nature, we find that they all have within them an intrinsic value or process that makes what it is. So, for example, fire it gives off heat and light and bright color, and it doesn't have to artificially do that. So it's within its dharma. A cup can hold the water because it's within its dharma that holds water naturally. So when I say Vedic, I'm talking about the original impulse at the core of civilization. It's like part of the natural phenomenon rather than this artificial imposition from minds of mankind, you know, who had some amazing peyote trip or whatever in ancient times and came up with this stuff. And um, so it's not that I'm trying to say it predates everything. What I'm saying is that there was an original template, and what we refer to as Vedic was just the recording of that template, and what we have today are remnants of that template, and I find what they call Hinduism in particular has kept it closest to its original source. Is there any sense that among uh, the faithful, uh, or those of you who've studied this, that given what you just said eligently and the fact that the the Rig Veda predates any other known religious document is there a feeling that this is the, perhaps the, the one the one true religion or, or a, a more more shall we say orthodox path than others um, I just I don't know about the one true religion because I mean to use a basic example you know we can have ice cream and we'll have chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, pistachio, whatever, and only a fool would try and say their favorite ice cream is the only ice cream in the world. And so the Vedic just represents that original template, and basically we, as humans, we have to look at time and circumstances, and we have to change the um, process accordingly. And so I don't like that term of one true original religion because that's why we're here and that's why free will is so important. And so we have this process within the Vedic system that has kept it closest to the template called Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. And they're the three pillars of a truth. So you go to the Guru, which is the wise teacher, and he'll tell you something. Then you go to the scriptures and you verify what the Guru says and it correlates. And then you go to the community of wise people and they're based on their experiential knowledge and you still see if it correlates and so when you find all three of those correlating you can be pretty sure you found the fact you found the truth and so just as we look at the creation of this world like I'm sitting here under a tree and the tree has bark has some flowers has its roots in the ground and so whatever a man can come over and trim the tree, you know, or let it grow wild as he likes, or fertilize it to make it grow more. That's our ability. But the original core of that tree is that it's a tree. And so I see all these religions, even the Abrahamic ones, they've, they've all have their roots in that original uh, Vedic tradition. And um, the problem comes about when people try to hijack these traditions as a means to control and dominate others. Well, I think that's that's well said. I mean, the, the um, when you talk about that ice cream analogy, I actually like that. I'm probably going to use that. Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a great analogy. I mean, that's part of the, the problem today. I mean, and even through the uh, first century, second century, you see all the Abrahamic faiths. 
they're the supremacist religion. They're the best, so that justifies them mm-hmm. for going around killing in the name of their religion in order to proselytize, you know, force converting yeah. the pagans, you know, ISIS today. I mean, it's just the list goes on and on. Um, yeah. But one of the things that was really intriguing to us is the fact that your research has led you to some symbolism that you see that goes back, that predates what we know today and kind of how they're all similar. Can you talk to a little bit about the symbolism that we still see today? Yeah, um, I actually wrote a book a couple years ago called The Serpent, the Eagle, the Lion, and the Disc. And I chose those four emblems or forces of nature because every civilization, every ancient civilization you go to, at its core, you'll find that the creator, so-called creator god, or the uh, supreme godhead, because sometimes, like in the Vedic tradition, the creator, he's not even God. He's like a, um, an evolved being. Like all of, According to the Vedic tradition, we can all become the creator. Brahma is his name. And so beyond the creator is the supreme, ultimate cause of all causes, the Adi Purusha, the original being. And we find that if you go to the Native American tradition, you'll find that the same symbols are used, and there'll be variations. Like, for example, we won't have lions so much, we have mountain lions or whatever, but you'll find that the same, like, cougar or the puma or the, um, you know, whatever is native to that area will stand in place of the lion. And then here in Hawaii, for example, we don't have snakes, but you'll find once again, what do they have representing the snakes will be the lizard. So everywhere in the world you keep finding that. And then the disc symbol, um, because according to my research and according to the ancients also, Humanity developed writing because they were actually becoming devolved and they needed writing to remember things. Whereas before they didn't need writing, they just needed a certain symbol and anyone who saw the symbol got it. And so what was the symbol for the Supreme Being? It was the disc, the circle. And as we know, we all have a mom and we all have a dad. So that's, that's the template right there. So there isn't only a God. There is also the Divine Goddess, the Mother. And once again, not only do we find the same symbolism representing God, who's also blue every blue or greenish everywhere you go, we find that the goddess is there, and she is always symbolized by, like, the red flower, the red color. And um, wherever you go, like the Isle of Rhodes is named after the Greek goddess Rodha, and then in the Vaishnav tradition, uh, the goddess is named Radha. And again, we find the red flower, the red um, dress, all that. So my question is, is why is it that every civilization you go to, every ancient, ancient, the more ancient, the more they correlate with each other? And it's not just one or two um, uh, exact symbols. It's uh, civilizations with the exact symbols. Can you take a shot? The same understandings of this great mother goddess and father god. And they're always blue, and the goddess is always like golden or um, light-colored yellow or something. And so we come down to the idea that somehow all over the world, humanity came up with the same exact iconography and anaconic symbolism and colors to represent the same things. Or maybe aliens came or something. Or what I'm suggesting is that civilization and religion came about because of the influence of these divine beings who are very real. And that's how it all began. So, I mean, I could go on. Yes. I I, I guess I would just uh, challenge you there a little bit. I think, um, I think definitely the goddess um, motif, that's something that was very important to the ancients and even within the Abrahamic faith, that's one of our, pet projects yeah, is, right. is showcasing the the goddess asherah who was wiped out of bring her back right yeah exactly just yep. kind of showing showing yep. everyone yeah your your god did have a wife too that's no different than any, yeah. any other <laughs> ancient face but based on our yeah. research we yeah. um our our stance is that we don't have divine um figures in antiquity that have inspired this we actually the the natural world that the ancients were living in were were the inspiration so that's why we see why the sun is so important that's why we disc right the 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 disc of the sun i mean you see uh amun ra ra all of Mm -hmm. the egyptian um even 
even uh, other religions have the sun being in a, a very important figure. They just call it different names. But our stance yeah. is that, um, you know, that you have uh, these ancient uh, civilizations that are living in a world that is unknown to them, and they start, yeah. you know, praying to and worshiping the natural world, which they cannot understand at the time. Hello? Can you uh, can you relate? Uh, you 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 related it to the Abrahamic faiths for us. Can you tell us how the cross uh, predates Christianity? Me or yeah, you Sean. go ahead. No, go ahead. You you're the guest. Oh yeah, the the cross, the swastika, all the the discs, they're all the same symbol. And yes, it's solar related. And I guess this is where we def- or I defer from the thesis you just presented is that it's completely correct that the sun is awe-inspiring and the sorts of, um, you know, mystical understanding in the ancients. But I'm taking it to a next level and saying, well, why is the sun inspiring? Not just because it's, you know, helps us grow food and it's warm and it's bright, but it's actually, you know, how many times, how many times does it say in, I think, pretty much every ancient scripture that the sun and the moon are like the eyes of God. And Krishna directly says like that in the Bhagavad Gita, the song of God. And so I'm not going to sit here and tell um, people, no, that's wrong and all that, because I find that truth is not just black and white like that. There's variation, variables within the same truth. And so I just feel like what I'm presenting is a next level, because whether, whatever it's the sun or the moon or the aliens, then who created those phenomenon? Right? right, and we'll say, well, they just it naturally came about. You know, it's, it's bo- believable, but the problem I have with it, because yes, I was raised hardcore ten years in this tradition, and um, people could say, well, you're just indoctrinated. But actually, when I was fourteen, I like fled. I want nothing to do with any religion, and um, and I have on- done an honest search on my own into all these questions. And what's been amazing me is how many times I keep finding these ancient scriptures making these statements, you know, like, okay, where did the sun come from? What is the sun? And so you look at, you know, Akhenaten, obviously, right? He, they say he brought monotheism to Egypt. But well, from my research, I find that he brought it back to the original template, and the people he was, he was fighting against had actually corrupted the original template. And what's missing in a lot of people's understanding is, to put it bluntly, love. And in the Vedic tradition, we call it bhakti. It's like love and devotion. And it's like we look all around us, whether it's animals, family, friends. Love is like that core element that inspires us. It gets us going. It makes us, it gives us impetus to function and strive in life. And so um, at the core of all this so-called religion, which as you probably know within Native American and also within the Vedic, there is no word for religion. It's like you don't, yoga is close or dharma or something. But what it is about is that understanding of devotion, of love, and hankering to be reunited with, like lover and beloved. And so all these elements around us, they can be kind of impersonal, like forces of nature, the sun and the moon and the thunderstorms and the lightning. But what these scriptures keep saying and bringing it back to is that personalized version of reality where, yes, there's a sun, but there's also a divine being who represents that sun. And so what the ancients, it's not me making this stuff up. It's like you go to thousands of year old scriptures and they'll be talking about these great seers and thinkers will talk about that principle of love. And so like religion, if I'm, if I remember correctly from the Latin, correct me if I'm wrong, it represents linking up in yoga um, and the word English word yoke are the same exact words it means to link. And so what are we linking to? And it's through the heart connection. So let's take the example. Language is another beautiful uh, proof, one of the proofs I present. So let's take the English word heart, cardiac. So we take the word and they always say the heart is the seed of God. And so many traditions say that. So if we look at Sanskrit, which seems to be the Nisradic, the most ancient known language from what I've seen, and we'll have the word heart. 
and in Sanskrit it's um, Hridaya, and its root version is Hrid, H-R-I-D. And if you take the word Hrid, Hridaya, Hrid means Hari, which is God, and Daya means Dias. So seed of God, so our very English word heart is directly correlates to the ancient word Hridaya, which means the seat of God. And so that's what seems to be missing in a lot of people's research into ancient religion and civilization is that key principle was actually love and the heart connection. And when religion moved away from that and got into power, domination, oppression, and control, then actually religion became the antithesis of true, quote-unquote, religion. So it's a big subject, and I try and present it there. And again... It come, ties into free will, and so there, these religions today, like a lot of the Islamic people and the Christians, and even I've seen in the tradition I grew up in with the Vaishnava with, of tradition, they get this idea that you've got to like indoctrinate people, force them, remove their free will. And so I don't know if you guys are parents, but I have kids... And I could tell my kids, clean your room. And if I scold them and they're afraid to get in trouble and they clean their room, it's like, okay, whatever. But if I never have to scold them and they actually clean their room out of their free choice, their free will, just because they know it makes me happy and it's the right thing to do, then I actually notice. So God's the same. It's that basic and simple. He, he gave us free will so that we can voluntarily choose God. And these traditions, these so-called traditions and religions that come and remove free will from us, they are actually the antithesis of what the original religion is about. So free will is so important. So I just write this stuff and I don't go around trying to, you know, Bible thump anyone or push it on anyone. It's like today I have my page, my Facebook page, website, and people are genuinely interested to go there. But in the ultimate conclusion is people, they need to take as much information they can and freely choose the path that's right for them. So um, I think that's true religion right there. Yeah, no, that's that's good. I think, um, you know, one of the things you brought up and one of the things we like to study is the evolution of what religion is and how it has affected humanity. And you had brought up Akhenaten. And for those yeah. that don't know Akhenaten, that is the uh, Egyptian pharaoh in the 1300s that... Um, changed the model yeah, from BC. Pop- yeah BC sorry 1300 BC correct thank you for correcting me um, he changed the model to go from strictly polytheism to monotheism um, now he did that for about 19 years 20 years and it unfortunately it ended up bankrupting a lot of the uh, various commerce and uh, areas around Egypt and after his reign they immediately went back to polytheism because that seemed to work better as a model for him but we, we definitely, that's one of the things we like to uh, study is how that, how that happened over time, why it's happening. Um, obviously, we come at it from a secular standpoint, but we come at it. Brand, is everything okay over there? Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry, just getting a lot of uh, background noise. We come, at it, we come at it from a secular standpoint, but we definitely do find allies from the theist uh, standpoint. Now, we are completely on... Um, this is the side of one religion not taking precedence over another. We don't. Yeah, we me don't too. Like, yeah. Uh, absolutely. We don't like killing innocent people, and unfortunately, religion's kind of done that over time. But we we're definitely on the side of the theists that like to have more of a peaceful spiritual existence. We have no issue with that. And one one of the groups that we kind of come in come in contact with that's in line with you are the Yazidis. <laughs> Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your work with the Yazidis and kind of how that started and how that relates to yeah. the Vedic? Yeah. Yeah. That was quite inspiring for me because that's one thing I noticed when I started doing this research. Because um, how I got into it was I would notice all these outrageous claims in the ancient traditions and these scriptures, and I'm just like, you know, that sounds ridiculous. You know, so I start researching and trying to find some. Um, context that makes sense to it and um as i went forward on it i find all these things start coming at me it's like the whole universe opens up to me almost to the point where it's overwhelming and um about two and a half years ago 
um, on Facebook, this uh, young lady named Nalene Solilo. Um, we connected on Facebook, and I looked at her page, and I see she's from Iraq, and she had all these like kind of Hindu iconogra- iconogra- iconographic uh, images and pictures, and um, and I just assumed, you know, I wasn't educated enough to understand that there's diversity even in the Islamic world. So um, I just assumed and said, oh, you're a young Muslim lady and what got you attracted to this Vedic Hindu gods and goddesses. And she's replied, no, I'm not Muslim, I'm Yazidi. And so I immediately, I'm what? What's Yazidi? And um, then we got talking and then she started sharing all this stuff. Is that, does she go on your show or you know her personally or? interacted with her yes we work um i work with her through facebook she uh she proposes different guests for the show so she's very involved oh yeah in and we've had like five years eating that guests yep. but not, not her specifically yeah but julie was on there i noticed yes. right yes like the yeah. leader yeah, yeah just very, a few weeks ago and actually yeah i'm here because of naline so thank you naline if you're listening and um, so basically I was startled and she just started sending me all this information and, um, you know, and in my own understanding, I assume, you know, I knew a lot, but there's always so much more to learn, which I actually like. And next thing I know, I'm like learning all about this information from Iraq, which as we know is the ancient uh, source of civilization for humanity. And I was so impressed with it. And at the time, I was working for a magazine, a Hindu magazine from England. And I said, hey, can you put this together in an article? And so she actually sent me two articles and got them both published. And um, for me, with the Vedic background, I got it right away. It's just like, why, you know, why do we have this young lady from Iraq basically sharing all this information that completely correlates and is accurate, accurate from the Vedic perspective, but coming from the Iraqi perspective. And I could tell she wasn't inventing it. And so um, I shared it and it caused a, quite a stir amongst the Hindu community. And then um, <clears throat> it was about that was like December, January 2013, January 2014, I got those articles published. And then the months went by. And then I was actually driving down the road towards Sandy Beach for a nice uh, sunset body surf session. And then, you know, the, some music was playing, and all of a sudden the news break came on, and Obama was announcing how he has to bomb, do some bombing campaign in Iraq to save the Yazidi people. And, oh, no, the day before that, Nalene had posted, like, kind of a heart-wrenching post on Facebook. And it was just, like, I don't know how people read this stuff and just go about their day. She's just like, oh, no, my brother, I think she said her father and uncle just got murdered by those ISIL terrorists. I don't like to call them ISIS because of the ancient goddess, right? I know. I know. That is is very unfortunate. Yeah, bastards, man. So, So then, um... And I was just feeling, you know, kind of powerless. And to be honest, it's a little guilty. It's like, so what? I could like get some articles published and, you know, kind of an egg-headed type of thing. And then I said, but meanwhile, you know, her close, near and dear ones are getting slaughtered. And I'm like on the way, next day I'm like on the way to the beach, you know, yippee doo, you know. And I just had this epiphany and just hit me and said, no, you know, you can't just relax. You know, you got to do something here. You can't just be talking, being all supportive and friendly. And the real, you know, you know, I don't know if I could cut on here, but the real crap hits the fan. You know, I disappear and I'm like, no way. So then um, I've had some connections with politics because like our congresswoman here, Tulsi Gabbard, I've known her since she was a young girl and she's, she's a Samoan white mix, but she declared herself a Hindu. And then I've also done a lot of work with the... Um, Indians, uh, especially the group Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangha, and they, the Prime Minister of India currently, Narendra Modi ji, is a member. And I've been working with them since 2001. And so I said, hey, I'm just going to give them my best shot, contact every heavy hitter I know, and, you know, urge them to do something. And um, that's what I did, just email, telephone. And I'm not exaggerating, less than 48 hours, 
you know, a storm started, you know, like all the Indian community just, you know, got into it. And I'm sitting there having a teleconference. There's probably 25 people. I didn't know any of them on there. And um, in the lean, like she underestimates herself. And she wasn't in any of these active telephone conferences, but she was my impetus. You know, she was, you know, she's the one who gets that fire going. And, you know, I try and tell her that, you know, she doesn't realize how successful she is. So I'm sitting there on these conferences and um, just throwing out ideas. And everyone's kind of, especially the Yazidi on there, we're kind of in panic mode, feeling powerless. And then, um, you know, how it is when you think of people, some people thinking like, hey, I have a piece of action, fame, money or something out of this. And everyone's wondering. And of course, they don't know me. So they're like, who's this white dude? You know, he's not a Hindu. He's not a Yazidi. Why is he here heading this up? So all that kind of tension undercurrents are there. But when I have to save people's lives, they can think anything they want. So, so we just started brainstorming and, um, and Julie was there, Julie Kalef, and she oh, basically, yeah, she's like, here we are, Lincoln, Nebraska, where the most Yazidi Americans are. And uh, we immediately said, let's do a protest at the White House. And then a businessman, um, Shashi, was on there. And he's just like, yeah, I'll pay for all of it. You know, pay for all the bus. And we shipped out a couple hundred within um, two days. We got them to D.C. And then, again, amazing synchronicity. I didn't arrange it, and I don't know how people could deny there's a higher power. Out of the blue, the spiritual, supreme spiritual leader of the whole Yazidi religion happens to show up in Washington, D.C., the day of our protest, right, with the head of the Yazidi Human Rights Group. And next thing I know, they're there at the protest with us in front of the White House. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and there's just too many amazing things happening, and I didn't arrange it, and nobody else arranged it personally, but it all correlated, and just that was our first punch, you know, like, bam, and you guys better take this, this, this seriously. And then um, we kept having these meetings and activist, activism and connecting behind the scenes, pressuring up in Congress when we're trying to, Congress people and government people trying to find sympathetic people. And then, um, next thing you know, Sri Ravi Shankar, the head of, head of living, because the Indian government, um, I think I can talk about it now, the government was due at the time, and uh, they have millions of Indian citizens who work in the um, Middle East, and so they were very nervous about retribution, you know, being taken against Indian citizens if India was actively involved. So what they did is they pulled in their soft power, and um, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar shows up in Iraq, holds a three-day peace conference, tours the Yazidi uh, refugee camps. Some of the pictures are amazing. You just see people embracing him and crying, just like, wow, somebody cares, you know. And um, so basically he went there, and then within a month, um, we pressured the U.S. Army, or he did, or his group, to drop 550 tons of supplies. And as you know, I don't know if you know, but the Yazidis have lost everything and they're trapped, pulled up on their sacred mountain with all they had left. And they were going to be finished. It would have been the end of one of the most, most ancient civilizations. And literally last year, Nalin, I, Julie, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's people, the RSS people, Tulsi Gabbard, we went to bat and we saved that civilization. And nobody got paid for it. You know, we actually lost money doing it. But we dropped all the supplies down there, and then behind the scenes, um, yeah, it's, I guess it's okay to talk about, but the SAS, British Special Forces guys, went in there as medical um, practitioners in the daytime, and nighttime they put on their counterterrorism gear and did what they had to do. And then I got a call, just like three people from... Um, Brandon, are you there? I'm here. Oh, sorry, you, you, you cut out for, for a second. second when you finished. Sorry. Oh, okay, I guess they didn't want this on here. So, anyway, but some big time people. I got a call this even three months ago, and um, I was told that a lot of retired generals from U.S. Army basically have been following our work, and they just they have this money, they have all these connections, and so what they've been doing. 
certain missions and uh, if you research you know what I'm talking about and um, so what it was totally grassroots effort and it's a little off topic of the ancient connections but the first thing is the living civilization and most civilizations we can go study them and they're mostly in a museum but when we have a living civilization yeah we could study them but we also have to not only preserve them we have to do what we can to enhance them so um, that's what we did and we're able to help them and why the Indians went to bat for them so readily is because if you compare the ancient Yazidi understandings, like in the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, it's one chapter from the world's most largest epic, Mahabharata. Even to this day, nobody's written such a large book. And um, in that book, Krishna is talking about how nobody dies, only the body dies, just as a man could take one shirt off and put on a new shirt. So the... Uh, the soul, the eternal soul, will leave an old body and get a new body. And that's a pretty exact quote. And so if you go to the Yazidi doctrine of reincarnation, they use that same exact example of changing your clothes to describe the immortality of the soul. And then um, I know with all of us, phallus worship is completely sacred and understandable, but a lot of people, they can't handle it. I put together total proof evidence that the ancient Yazidis pretty much have the same exact Vedic system of worshipping what we call the, the linga, the creative principle of the universe, the phallus and the vagina, the, they call the yoni and the linga, represent creation. And sex is actually creative urge, creative energy. That's why we have babies, we have sex. So we find in the Yazidis, um, they had the same exact correlation. They embrace the lingam, they want babies. Um, so many that they tie around with certain things. And um, what's interesting is I put together a whole um, album, all these photographs and evidences, and luckily I have it on my computer. But I've had Facebook since early 2008, never had anything removed from my Facebook account except that one, one um, file it was completely removed. And, like it's still there, titled there, but everything's removed, stripped out of it. And um, there's so many different things. Um, you see they worship the peacock king. And uh, we have in the Vedic tradition, Krishna, he's always wearing the peacock feather. And also the god of war, Skanda, is always riding the peacock. Tasmolic. And Yes, easy, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so just, oh, and that was the other thing, this very word, Yazidi, right? If you go to the Zoroastrian. That's what they try and say. It's related to Zoroastrian, but then Zoroastrian is related to Vedic. And so Yazidi is related to the Vedic word Yagya, which means those who sacrifice, those who offer, um, you know, things to the higher powers, to the divine principles in order to be, have relationships, not just about praying and begging and getting something you want. It's just about having a given, a given, not you know, give and give relationship, give and receive relationship. So we offer sacrifice to the divine and the divinities offer back to us with charity. So the Yazidi is directly related to the Sanskrit word Veda through the Zoroastrian term for yagya, which is sacrifice. There's so many evidences and I could actually focus on that the rest of my life and um, it's difficult but, um, yeah, anyone who sincerely looks at this stuff, you'll find that there was an original template and whether it was we all had one civilization and we were all overawed by forces of nature or, you know, there actually is a divine impetus civilization. And the reason I go for the divine impetus theory is just because there's too many ancient texts and scriptures that make that claim. So wouldn't that mean that they're full of crap and they're just making it up? And then having the Vedic thing, even the motto of modern India, Satyameva Jayate, which means truth is always triumphant. And we have in the Vedic tradition the four legs of Dharma, cleanliness, uh, truthfulness. Um, I can't remember the two others, but the only one left is truthfulness in the age of, that we're in, Kali Yuga. And so truthfulness is so integral to the tradition, so it just boggles my mind 
that would actually develop all these concepts and theories about the origins of civilization based on a lie and then repeatedly say truthfulness is the root of our culture. It doesn't make sense to me. And then just too many times I've seen amazing synchronicities come up whenever I pursue this work. Well, I just want to say, Brandon, I just want to say congratulations on that um, campaign uh, the, yeah, the, uh, for the Yazidis in, in Mount Sinjar. That actually made uh, national news. I see there's a lot of articles in CNN. Um, and, mm-hmm. yes, thank you to Nalene. She definitely has kind of brought us on a couple years ago yeah. onto the, uh, yeah. the plight of the Yazidi uh, people and culture. So we've, we're definitely trying our best to, to help out. I know they have a... Uh, they have a fundraiser coming up in LA uh, soon. Oh yeah! And I just want to uh-huh. get—I'll get—I'm going to get some info from Nalene, and I'll get that on the sites and things yeah. like that. But yeah, that's something we're, we want to promote too. He's Brandon yeah. Parker. You're listening to the Mythicist Milwaukee Show, and he is very well versed in Vedic uh, tradition and scripture, and uh, he can really go. It's already 2:40. <laughs> I'm going to take a little Thank station you. break here. I want to uh, remind everyone to find us now, uh, follow us, and like us. On iTunes, very exciting to be on iTunes. It's easy to find the archives there, as well as our YouTube channel. hope everybody goes there and subscribes. Uh, and on that YouTube channel, you can also find the Holy Shit video series, uh, a satirical uh-huh. look at the uh, uh, traditions of the uh, Judeo-Christian Bible. And uh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, some of us are involved in it, so I try not to pat ourselves on the back too no, much. But really uh, people it's do seem really to like good. it. Yeah, go there and give it a thumbs up vote if you don't mind. And uh, look for the full length feature, Batman and Jesus, which Mythicist Milwaukee will be uh, sponsoring and pr- helping produce this coming year and over the next couple of years. Uh, you got a myth for us today? It's uh, already time for our feature, which we like to call. Myth of the day, 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 day. Here is Mythmeister Antonio with today's Myth of the Day. Take it away, Antonio. Thank you again for being on the show today. I'm going to keep this uh, in line with uh, Hindu fables since we have brought up some Hinduism uh, in this uh, talk here. So here we bring the story of Nachiketa. is a Hindu fable about a boy whose heart had received the truth taught in the scriptures. Nachiketa's father gives him up to be killed, and Jesus accepts his destiny and states, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. In Nachiketa's story, he accepts his destiny and states, like corn, a man ripens and falls to the ground. Like corn, he springs up again in his season. Jesus spends three days in a tomb, and Nachiketa subsequently spends three nights in the house of the king of death. Jesus resurrects and raises to eternal life. Nachiketa then receives the secret of immortality. That is our myth of the day. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Our weekly feature Mm -hmm. myth of the day brought to you by Kenosha Racine Atheists and Freethinkers Activism. In southeast Wisconsin, but I think I think that was a great, uh, great one to pick there, Antonio, because it really showcases how you know Brandon's talking about synchronism, how we see the same stories and the same motifs over and over and over, and you can date them back as far as the Vedic tradition, the Zoroastrian tradition, the Egyptian tradition. So, well, um, I really love it, and I'm glad you brought that up again because I wanted to, I always say to myself, kind of what attracts me to mythicism is the is the uh, the, the the emphasis on research and education and the promise perhaps of finding a kind of a root myth where it all started and it sounds kind of like Brandon's sort of got it and uh, uh, he's, he, he sees a, uh, a divine truth behind it which of course we don't uh, but I think w- what we're talking about is the same thing a, a, a method of 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 uh, fostering understanding cross cultural cu- cross cultural understanding empathy. Uh, and a realization that no matter what you believe, it all basically stemmed from the same well, and, human and experience exactly. at one point. And, and one of the things we like to bring up, too, are, is a lot of these stories are centered around the sun, the moon, the, and nature, because that's how humanity survived. We had to know when the sun was coming back. We had to know when the Nile was going to be flooded. And, you know, we had to know when all of these things were happening in order to survive as a, as a, a humanity. So it, they definitely contain scientific uh, information it's it's kind of dialed up as entertainment because that's what it was as well but definitely mm. a lot of important in scientific information in there also 
We uh, have uh, some chatters listening, and uh, Chatter Jason would uh, like to know, how would you confirm or falsify your theory of divine truth behind all human religion, Brandon? Uh, confirm? Yeah, well, keep in um, mind, we have mostly atheistic audience, I want to say, so yeah, I think you're getting oh, a little okay. backlash from your divine, <laughs> your divine truth yeah. uh, uh, assertion, so go well, ahead and, uh, and talk to us. First, I wanted to say that's one of the beauties with the Vedic tradition, or Dharmic tradition, is that we have some great atheistic thinkers and sages, and they're completely respected and recognized. They don't, they're not attacked or looked upon as the Antichrist or anything, so to say. And, um, Which is it's good like to hear. About, yeah. <laughs> I, Go said ahead. That, I said that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's why, like I said, you know, I didn't just get indoctrinated and run around with the stuff. It's like I started looking back at it, and I was very impressed with the, the value of, you know, human spirit, you know, the value of the free will. And um, so how to confirm it, again, I, I just look at um, different levels. I try to have three levels of evidence and um, before I'll present anything like in my book. And um, one of them, obviously, is the ancient text and finding the same statements or like myths or stories, like the one you just presented, you know, going through like a, a thread, going through a necklace, you know, and, and all those truths are held onto the necklace through that string of truth, um, like the foundation that holds the truth throughout different cultures, traditions, and civilizations. And so when I see that, you know, I have to look at it and say, okay, that's a great idea. Now let's look at it scientifically and does it hold up? And if it holds up scientifically, and um, does it hold up with, you know, direct evidence, like archaeological evidence or linguistic evidence? And um, basically, there is an element of faith in there, for sure. Um, so you know, to be concrete, 100% proof, um, I don't think I can in one sentence. And in terms of falsifying it, yeah, I don't think... You can falsify it either. So um, that's why we're here. It's like we have our own conscience and understanding, and we're supposed to use our own free will and expertise to look into things and understand them and then experience them. And that's experiential knowledge is so important. And so again and again, for me, I don't know if it's considered absolute proof, but just to see so many great thinkers from so many traditions you know, verifying the same things. Because, like, I don't know if you know, within our Vedic tradition, we have what's called a Sampradaya. And what that means, it's a lineage. And so there's the teacher, and then his students, and then the students become teachers, and they have their students, and they maintain these core truths all the way through. So, like, um, when I was in India a couple years ago, I met this um, monk, and he was, like, in his 90s, and I started telling him about my research, and he got all excited, and he just started pulling out ton, hundreds of handwritten notes and paper, and he was showing that every letter of the alphabet, including the English alphabet, and every number directly correlates to, to the divine, to God and the goddess. And um, I feel like that if someone like that, if his research is taken seriously and funded, he could do a lot to show the proof. And then... Um, you know, empirical knowledge is there, so I don't know if that answers the question. Well, I think, but like, I think but, it, I in, think a, it in a Hawaii kind of way. I think it, I think it does. Yeah. But I, you know, <laughs> what what I like what Brandon's doing, and I think more people need to do this. You know, when so many people are born into their culture as a Christian or as a Jew or as a a Muslim, um, and they're so de- to loyal and devout, dogmatic, in their, in their yeah. faith and dogmatic. Yeah. Yet they they yeah. they do not take it one step further and do what Brandon's doing and let's go back earlier let's see what what predated this you know because the Abrahamic faiths we all know are very new and you know they don't and, and when it comes to the timeline they don't they shouldn't get the same respect as these older religions because they've been around <laughs> for so long um, you know if people if more people just kind of dig back and and look at where you know with the foundations of their own religions I think you'd have more tolerance you'd have more people understand you know, that there are a lot of common, 
ground. There is a lot of common ground that people can meet on. And um, it definitely, I think it leads to more peaceful, you know, situation. Yeah. Well, and also like in, in my guru, um, like he's from an ancient lineage and everything he told me, he'll back it up with, you know, some scriptural quote or a quote from a previous Acharya or spiritual leader. And right there, directly in the Bhagavad Gita, again, Krishna says, Tadvidi pranipatena pariprakshena sevaya upadeshyanti tasmina. Um, basically, it means I was gonna say that, that you don't go to you don't go to a guru and just ask a question and get the answer. Oh, thank you for shining the light on the truth. It's like no, you challenge him, but in a in a proper attitude, and never accept it just because he said it. Like you know, for me, when you have a tradition that directly tells you that, don't just believe what you hear. Exactly. You ask questions. Yeah, get the answers and then check it out yourself. You right. know, so right. I mean, how so many? How many churches do you see where, you know, the, the priest or the pastor or the minister is proselytizing and then you ask questions and then they don't answer it? I mean, we just had... Yeah, and they'll actually threaten you or something. Exactly. We just had... What the hell? Of, we had one of the, uh, I guess, the largest proselytizers of the Christian religion currently, Ken Ham, mm-hmm. in uh, Milwaukee, and he was trying to sell his ark that he's trying to build. He needs $89 million to do oh, it. Oh, no. And he did this uh, hour and a half long lecture slash, I don't know, what do you want to call it, business meeting, essentially sales pitch. But at the end of it, he didn't take any questions. You know, I mean, that's, mm-hmm. you know, we had you we had people in there educated on our side. We really wanted to ask some questions of this guy. He wouldn't take them. You know, I think mm-hmm. I think that's it. If, if you tell people that they can't ask questions, you definitely need to be weary of what you belong to. Yeah. How can we make people yeah. pay attention to that simple principle? The people who we need to learn that won't, they don't care. Right. They, won't, yeah. they won't open their eyes. To yeah, that's anything. super important. Like, people need to think, you know, don't be fooled. And um, someone who can't stand, like for me, like, I actually find that when I get questions, you know, even if I can't answer right on the spot in terms of my research, it puts me in a path to doing much more in-depth investigation on the matter. And, you know, that's science. That's, um, you know, because actually I don't even like this term religion. It's actually a science, you know. It's like, like my guru, A.C. Bhakti, even on I mean, Prabhupada, said that um, without science is emotional belief. And science without religion is atheism or something like that. So, um, you know, basically you have to have a scientific approach to it. And then another point I think we're running out of time to bring up that's really crucial is context. And I find that can make or break a case, a theory. But I here and simply she was pointing out that this ancient iconography that they have and they'll show all these people on their heads on the ground. Brandon, and, we're, Brandon, we're losing you a little bit. Breaking up. Oh, yeah. They're saying that um, they found some ancient inscription of the king and the queen. People were bowing with their heads on the ground and they're saying, oh, this guy turned into a megalomaniac. Look at these inscriptions. It's my tradition, we understand, like, um, the king and the queen, they're actually representatives of the divine on it. And it's actually not who's job, you know, you got to serve. You really are the primary servant of the whole country. And so the people are bowing out of gratefulness, and it's actually a sign of affection and love. So even in India today, we bow down. Like, well, even, you know, you walk in and you see your grandma, you bow down at her feet. And you can't say, oh, grandma's a megalomaniac now. So a lot of times people have these Western kind of oriented contexts and they'll straight jacket, them, straight jacket them onto the ancients and come up with these theories and then teach them to young minds and then people run around with the worst impressions of the ancients. So context is one of the most crucial elements required to understanding the ancient truths. And then um, we'll have... Um, Again, I wanted to talk about his, like not and how he prayed to the sun, like he directly would praise the sun and all that. He was, he was showing that the sun was representing a higher principle. And again, if you take those prayers and you attach them to the ancient dietary mantra, the sun from the Vedic, it's almost the same. It talks about the lions roaring and waking up in the morning, and um, 
like 10 different things. I correlated them. And um, again, the context is so important to understand that. And so in conclusion, why I'm focused and keyed on the Vedic ancient Indian tradition, because it's the only thriving ancient civilization that's still functioning to the point where you can go look at it and ask, well, why do you guys do that? And they'll give you a correct, accurate answer as to why they do that. So a good example, do you guys know what kumkum is? or uh, vermilion powder, the Indian woman wear on their foreheads and show they're married. Yeah, and put on. yeah so um, for some reason, if you go around all these ancient tombs in Central America, China, Egypt, India, Japan, Siberia, often they'll find that the walls of these tombs are coated with vermilion powder and same exact stuff. And modern scientists, just anthropologists say, yeah, hey, we don't know what that's is. And so I say, well, why don't you go to the one being living civilization that still uses that vermilion powder and ask and research, well, what do they use it for? And then compare it to see what they used it for. And you might actually come up with an accurate answer. And again and again, we'll have like eagles, hawks, lions, tigers, um, Serpents, yeah, the serpents are always the key elements of creation. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, and everywhere you go, like, it has the same thing. Like, why doesn't the serpent represent the god of eating in one culture and another place, the god of dancing or something? But no, it's always tied at the core element of creation, the serpent. And then we go to, the, like, the Bible, and we have this Genesis, and um, it's related to the god Janus. Uh, from the Romans, right? And he, right, he's the god of doorways and beginnings, and Genesis is beginning, and Ganesh is the god of, like, before you do anything in the Vedic tradition, you offer a prayer to Ganesh to remove your obstacles. He's the um, god of beginnings. And then we find this Adam and Eve story, it's like ridiculous, if you look at it from today's the state. Mm-hmm. The ancient Vedic thing they talk about Paramatma, Atman, Adam, and Jiva, which represents the supreme divine being, Jiva, right? And the fruits of the tree. Um, I'm quoting the Bhagavad Gita, but it's, you can see why it's at the core of Hinduism. But right in there, Krishna talks about two birds in a tree. One is you, me, you know, Krishna speaking. And the bird is always turning away from and eating this fruit, that fruit, trying to enjoy this world. And if he just turns to Krishna, then basically he'll be back. It's not like you convert. It's like you just come back to your true identity. And so from what I found, like even this Genesis story, the Adam and Eve thing, it's just been completely changed in terms of its context. But if you take the underlying template, once again, you find it completely correlated. That is, um, then we have Abraham. Brandon, Brandon, and, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to let that be the last thought. We have two minutes. Just uh, if you want to quickly tell okay. everyone where people can find you, find your book, and what's coming up next. Two minutes. Okay, so I wrote this book, uh, Surf the Eagle, the Lion and the Disc. And you know, I'm honored to be here um, with the secular atheist audience because that means you guys are true thinkers, and I personally man of faith and not threatened by it at all and find people like you much more accepting and like I don't have any hardly any religious people except my workers I'm basically saying none of you have a monopoly <laughs> you're all the same and they fucking hate it <laughs> 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 to be honest you know right. and so um, basically the serpent the eagle the lion and the disc and it's cool. it's about I self books that have published in India bring it down to like 10, 15, and, but I put all kinds of color, full color pictures, images in there, and I'm not trying to push anything on anyone. I'm just saying look at it with an open mind. And then I have a website called VedicEmpire.com, and um, I had some technical problems, but it should be back up within the next couple of days. And then another thing I do real quickly is because we're representing a living culture, living culture, I should say, I, events, where we bring dance, music, art, food, seconds. modern setting with DJs and music and bands, and we live and experience this tradition.
traditions like the ancients did. That's excellent. So I'm thank, thank you for having me. It's a great honor, and I look forward to in touch. I'll check out your YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel, Brandon Parker. There it is. Check Aloha. it out. He's Brandon Parker. Uh, thanks for joining us, and make sure you hit us next week when Kenneth we will Humphreys. be with Ken Humphreys, our old buddy from England. Take it easy, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Aloha.